You may have heard of the phrase dead reckoning, um, which is also known as point navigation. Now, if you have, great. If you haven't, then hopefully after this, you'll know what it is and how to use it. Now, dead reckoning is very similar to something which we all do all the time, which is simply to follow a compass bearing. But with dead reckoning, there's something extra. As well as walking in a certain direction, you can also walk for a specific distance. So it's this combination of direction and distance which makes dead reckoning, you know, especially useful when you're in poor visibility. So, you know, at night or in a forest or when it's foggy. As an example, if you know where you started and which direction you've been walking and how far you've traveled, you'll also know your current location. Or another example, if you want to head to a specific place, which is in a certain, you know, which is a certain distance away, you can walk towards it until you've covered that distance and then you'll know you've arrived. Oh, just one thing here. There's not normally many good reasons to use dead reckoning for more than a few hundred meters. You know, there's a lot, there are many um, easier and faster ways to cover longer distances. So for dead reckoning, all you need to know is the direction of travel and the distance. And here I'm talking about land navigation, by the way. Dead reckoning at sea requires some different information. Now, the direction is easy, as we can just, you know, take a compass bearing from a map and follow it. Um, and the way to do this is always break it down into legs. A leg is just a section of an overall walk. And this bit's really important. When you're following a compass bearing, some people call that an, an azimuth, you need to always walk to something that you can actually reach, you know, or you'll almost certainly end up in the wrong place. So the way to do this, to follow a bearing, as I said, is always walk to something that you can actually reach. So, you know, you line up your compass with something, a noticeable feature that you can see between, you know, that's along your bearing and you walk to it. And then when you get to it, you do exactly the same again. As an example, say I want to walk to my rucksack. Imagine I can't see my rucksack. Just imagine. <laughs> I know that my compass is on a bearing of one, two, three. What I don't do is I don't take a bearing a lot on the horizon because I can't reach that. All I do is I walk along my bearing, my one, two, three bearing, until I get to here. So I get to this rock, which, and then I point my compass again, find something else that I can reach, and I walk to it. And I just keep leapfrogging and doing that until I arrive at my rucksack. Okay, so it's got to be something that you can actually get to. Now, so the, the compass, the bearing is very easy to do. You know, but if you want to head to a specific location, which is on a bearing, you're going to need to know how far to walk. You know, again, it's simple as you can just measure it on your map. As an example, I measure something on my map and it's 250 meters away. Okay, so how will I know when I've walked? I'm on my bearing. How will I know when I've walked 250 meters? Well, in open countryside like this, you can either use timing or you can use pacing. So let's say normally it takes me at four kilometers an hour, it'll take me a minute and a half to walk 100 meters. So 250 meters is going to take me, let's have a look, two, three, it's gonna, it's gonna take me three minutes, 45 seconds. So we'll call it four minutes. Or if I want to use pacing, as I normally take 64 paces, double paces, every 100 meters, it's going to take me 160 paces. So I can either use timing or pacing to walk and along my bearing for 250 meters. And when the timing or pacing, you know, reaches its end, I'll know I'm at the location. Okay, <laughs> now that was an easy one. You know, <laughs> you're not going to take a bearing 250 meters and walk along it. So let's do something a little bit more realistic. So I've just walked along the crag. I'm here at the end of Ingscar Crag. I'll drop this onto your screen so you can see, you know, you can see what I'm talking about. Now, at the moment, as I said, I'm here at the northern end of Ingscar Crag. And I want to go to, let me find something on the map. Let's say I want to go to this cairn. Um, for those of you who are not from the UK, a cairn on an Ordnance Survey map shows you where there's a, a man-made pile of stones. 
Okay, now as you can see from the map, the cairn is, I'm trying to measure as I talk, <laughs> the cairn is 920 meters away and it's on a grid bearing of 346. Okay, now this brings me round to one of the most important things about dead reckoning. It's almost never used on its own, but rather it's normally the technique that is used on the last leg of the walk from your attack point, you know, to the destination. So you'll navigate to your attack point and from there you'll use dead reckoning. Now, all the other legs on the walk, they'll, they'll use different strategies. And the trick is here, keep things really, really simple. The simpler something is, the less likely it is to go wrong. So don't start, you know, if you don't need to, don't start doing, you know, resections or calculated back bearings or anything like that. I'll give you an example. From here, I want to go to the cairn on the map. Now, do I go left or do I go right? Where's the cairn? <laughs> Which way do I walk? Once again, let's keep this really simple. Let's just orient our map. So all I'm going to do, put my compass on the map and rotate the compass and the, you know, the map as well, until the red end of the needle, the north end, is pointing straight up the map. The map is now oriented. So anything north on the map is actually you know, that's what I can see over there. Anything that's shown on the map as being south is in that direction. You see, so I standing here like this, I know that I'm here on Ingscar Crag. The cairn is there, so I simply look along the map and I know that the cairn is in that direction. So now it's even simpler than do I go left or right. I know that from here, I just walk forward. You see what I mean? It's keep it really simple. So I'm going to go in that direction and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll have another chat in a moment. From here on Ingscar Crag, after just over 100 metres, we're going to come to a wall junction where four paths come together. So our navigation strategy for the first leg will be simply to walk to the wall. We'll aim off to the west and then turn right down the wall, hand railing it, you know, just to make sure we don't miss the junction. Um, and we'll keep going until we find a, a way of getting over the wall. And then we'll follow the track, which runs approximately north from the track junction. Next, on the map, you can see that our track goes over some contour lines. So it'll be going uphill, and it will pass between Deanmore Hill on the left and another raised section on the right. So our strategy for this particular leg will be feature recognition. You know, we'll be walking along looking around, trying to recognize the features shown on the map. In some countries, feature recognition is called terrain association. Then we'll continue following the footpath up until it meets a bridleway, almost at right angles. As long as you stay on the tracks in this area, then you should be okay. Um, you know, you'll be fine. Tracks, footpaths, you know, that sort of thing. As soon as you step off them, you need to watch where you're going, especially in this area. <laughs> I don't know anywhere else in Britain that you'll see this. This is a mine shaft. It's actually open. It's an open mine shaft. Um, you, <laughs> you really don't want to walk down there. Oh well. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what these are. As you can see, <laughs> there's another one there, another mine shaft. And that's a big one. As I said, I don't know anywhere else in Britain where the mine shafts are just left open. Um, sometimes you'll see them, the farmers have put uh, fences around them to stop sheep going into them, but uh, not this one. <laughs> around this area, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of lead mines. Um, the Romans used to dig lead in this area and it's been going on forever. These mines, by the way, at this scale, they're normally from the 1700s to the mid 1800s. But, if you leave the track, you need to be aware that these things are around it. A good, a telltale sign for lead mines, by the way. Can you see behind this, can you see behind me, there's a patch of earth with nothing growing on it. Yeah. So that is a telltale sign for lead mines. Uh, well, let's go and find a smaller one just so I can explain. Here's another two mine shafts behind me. And if you look, there is 
patches of brown earth behind it. The reason it's brown and it's a telltale sign for, <laughs> be very careful, that's a telltale sign for that, is because that's the spoil from the, uh, from the mine. And as they brought it up, you know, the majority of the lead would be taken away for processing, for smelting. But the spoil, which is the, the, the soil and the small rocks and everything, would just literally be dumped outside the top of the mine shaft. And as it contains a higher concentration of lead than the normal ground, nothing will grow on it. So even now, so these mine shafts were dug early 1700s maybe, so they're 300 years old. And still, if you look, after 300 years, nothing is growing on the spoil piles. So this isn't really waffle, this is more of a, it's, it's a safety, safety thing. If you come up into this area and you leave the track, just you know, keep a good look out where you're going. These, these are man-made, obviously there were shake holes and potholes and you know, <laughs> stay on the tracks. That's a, anyway, <laughs> back to dead reckoning. So I'm quite confident that this is the track junction. Now, just a quick point. You can see it's getting foggier and foggier all the time here. What happens if we'd missed this track junction? How would we know? You know, it's just a wide open expanse. How would we know that we'd miss this track junction? Let me just turn the camera around and I'll show you. We've been walking basically north from Ingskar Crag all the way to here. And as you can see on the, I'll, I'll drop this onto your screen. As you can see on the map, after the junction, there's one more contour line. So, you know, it raises up another 10 meters at least. And then in, from there, in all directions, it's down. Now, anybody can tell if they're walking downhill. So that will be our catching feature. Don't forget a catching feature is something that says to you, stop. <laughs> something doesn't seem right have a look at the map and you know your compass and just check what check what's happening you know things go wrong all the time so catching features are very important so behind me as you can see that's if we'd have continued north we would have gone to the top of that and from there it's downhill all the way so as I said that would be our catching feature now we'll use this track junction as our attack point an attack point is just something that's obvious and easy to find. It's obvious on the map and it's easy to find on the ground. It's something that you know that you can definitely get to. Okay, and also <laughs> that it's as close as possible to your final destination. You know, if there's something between here and your final destination, I don't know, a track, another track junction or something, then go to that first and then, you know, continue on from there. So to get to this attack point, we've used a number of different navigation strategy. And it doesn't matter if you don't know the names of them. I mean, I have to, because it's my job. But for most people who can navigate, this is the sort of thing that you do all day, every day, without even thinking about it. You know, it's looking at your map, walking around, looking around, so everything was really simple. So there's no calculated back bearings or resections or intersections or anything like that. All we've done to here is basically just walk along looking around and every now and again checking our map to make sure that we're going in the right direction. Just in the last few hundred meters, you know, from Ian Crag, we've used, what, what, what strategies have we used? We've used hand railing, map orientation, aiming off, feature recognition, catching features, you know, etc, etc. So the last one we're going to use is dead reckoning, but we're still going to have a catching feature just in case we miss the can or it's not there. Cairns, by the way, are probably the least reliable um, things that are on an <laughs> Ordnance Survey map. Sometimes they're moved, sometimes they're in the wrong place, sometimes, yeah, sometimes <laughs> you know, it'll show Cairn and there'll be three of them, so you get confused when you arrive. So don't rely on Cairns, it's, uh, it's <laughs> they're not very reliable. So once again, we're still going to have a catching feature just in case. And the catching feature, again, will be if we start going downhill, then we've gone too far. So from the last, for this last leg, I need to walk from here to the cairn. There aren't any features between where I am now and my destination. So I'm going to have to use dead reckoning. So what I do, I'll drop this onto your, onto your screen. I'm going to 
take a bearing from here to the uh, where the can is and it's 20 degrees and it'll be it's exactly 200 meters in this area there's a tiny less than a quarter of a deg degree of declination so I won't be adjusting my compass for declination I can't see the can from here so I'm going to have to keep stopping and checking my direction um, you know checking I'm walking on the right bearing so I'm not going to use timing as it's 200 meters that's 64 so it's 128 paces from here on a bearing of 20 degrees so let's set off and it is in that direction so I need to find something that is exactly along my bearing and I've got a very prominent tussock so I'm going to walk from here to that tussock and once I arrive I'll do some I'll continue leapfrogging on Five. 76 paces to this point here so when you're dead reckoning you don't really need your map you know you can pack it away it's 76 paces to here so all I need to do is I need to take a look along my bearing find something to walk to and then walk to that what you don't do is you don't keep looking at your compass set your destination you know a tussock or a rock or something like that put your compass down and walk to it and then start again okay so 76 <laughs> my bearing now there is a i won't say prominent but there is a sticking up rock just there so i shall walk to that and then carry on 77 78 79 <laughs> this spot here is where the can should be but it's not here um that's what i was saying what an anticlimax all this video to find a can and it's not here i said cans are not reliable uh, it doesn't matter i'll report it to the uh, ordnance survey on monday and um, they're actually really nice um, and they want people to report errors but there may have been a can here at one time but it's not here now now, if I was heading to something that I knew would be there, like um, a bridge over a river or a road junction, or if I was orienteering, I was looking for a control point, then now is when I would start my search techniques to try and find it. But uh, search techniques, I'll do a video on those you know, as and when I've got time. But what we'll do is just have a quick check around this area just to make sure that I haven't missed it. Um, because you know it might be somewhere else so let's have a look I'll drop this onto your screen can you see this very small section of the contour line which heads north okay from the top of that section the can should be just 30 meters on a bearing of let's have a look bearing of 310 so I'll just go and see if I can find it and uh, then we'll uh, see what there is so here we are, 30 metres on a bearing of 310. This is it. This is the spot. Um, the can just isn't here. Oh well, <laughs> these things happen. So let's have a very brief recap on, you know, dead reckoning. Just before I have my sandwiches, I don't know what I've got today. Oh, cheese and onion. <laughs> it's all good. So dead reckoning can be very loosely described as walking along a bearing for a set distance. Okay, now... For dead reckoning, you need to know where you started, you need to know your bearing and how far you're going to walk. And then you can use timing or pacing to, you know, work out how far along your bearing you've, you've actually gone. Don't forget that dead reckoning is, it's, it's only used when a faster or simpler navigation method is is not appropriate so if there are no features between you know you and your destination that's when you would use dead reckoning but any other time navigate to a feature and then use the last feature as an attack point so that's it hopefully you now understand what dead reckoning is thanks for watching